David said it was good to be in the house of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. God is doing some marvelous, marvelous things within his people, even when they don't even realize what he's doing. <laughs> I talk to so, so many people who are discouraged, and even mostly now as Christians, and the question always comes to mind, where is God at in all of this? And I'll show you my subject title, and, and uh, I may get finished up today with the book of Hebrews. What, what's it going to take? What is it going to take for God to bring us to, for us to understand that he's going to bring us through? And the body of Christ plays such a major, major role in the end times that we're in. Now, you would have to be, I don't know, brain dead, I guess, to not understand that these days in which Jesus predicted were come, we act like that we're surprised that they're here. And I don't understand why. And so I don't get anxious about all the rhetoric that's going on uh, within the secular world. You know, China's going to come to blows because Pelosi goes over to Taiwan. Big deal. Keep her. I'm good. Just keep her. You can have her. We've had many years of her. Put her on your government. Let us see what happens there. And the crazy stuff that we see going on. Now, church, we have to be real about this. We live in a dangerous society and it has nothing to do with a gun control it has to do with sin and a heart control that's what it has to do with man and our woman is going to find a way to destruct other people no matter what the weapon is there will always be one and so we have to learn that we're living in the perilous times we're living in the times in which Jesus said there will be pestilence and diseases, and we have them in a rapid sensation of like we've never experienced before. I never thought in our lifetime that we would ever have anything that would shut us behind the doors of our house, shutter the doors of the church, and make us wear things that we don't need to wear because they don't work anyway, and have to stay away from people and our kids could no longer go to school, and all of those other crazy things that went on. We live in that world now, and that world is not going to get any better till Jesus comes back. Now, we can slow the progression. We can even change the nature of our economy in whatever the next vote may be, how we vote. It will make all the difference in the world. But you're not going to hinder nor stop the plan of God. So now as the church of God, as men and women of God, as spirit-filled people of God, we had to have to get in the program or hide in a cave, one or the other, because you can't play both sides and in the middle. Now, I heard something very interesting just a while ago when my TV was on. I was, I was watching a, a gospel station, and this man made a statement that will perk up your ears. Now, before you shut me down and or him, listen to the entirety of the statement. And here's what caught my ears. He said, there will be no Pentecostals in heaven. And I went, oh. There will be no Charismatics in heaven. There will be no Methodists going to heaven. There'll be no Baptists, or there'll be no Wesleyans, or Episcopalians, or whatever church that you think you attend you won't be there the people that will be there is the children of God who's given their heart to Jesus Christ regardless of what church they went to <laughs> and that makes our outlook all different than what you could imagine because we practice being things that we're not and the church has to come and it will it will come into a unified fashion of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now, with this book of Hebrews in the 11th chapter, we've been taught many things out of it. 
and all been good. I, I don't know of any bad messages that ever came out of it. But I, I think with a deeper understanding of even the title, the title to it, if I asked any of you in here today, why is the book of Hebrews named the book of Hebrews? You, you go, duh. And, and, and I would too, until I, God laid it upon my heart. Why did I name that book that? I go, I have no idea. All I've ever heard is the book of Hebrews. But why was it done like that? Well, the reason is, and just the historical facts so you'll better understand the book. It will give you that uh, insight. It is called the book of Hebrews because Paul, we believe, was the author of that book. And 90% of this book refers to the Old Testament where the Hebrews were at with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, uh, Ezekiel, and all of those. They were Hebrews. And so Paul and whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, and I believe it was Paul by the writings in which I see, and many other, many other well-known uh, preachers uh, believe the same thing. And you, uh, you know, but anyway, I irrelevant. It's irrelevant about who wrote it. It's, it's relevant about who it's written about. And all of Hebrews has everything to do with the references of the Old Testament. It quotes the Old Testament more than any and all of the books in the New Testament. Keeps going back to Scripture, going back to Scripture, going back to Scripture. Why? Because the, the Jews who had converted uh, to Christianity still had one foot in Judaism. And that was causing an issue within the early church. And if it wasn't cleared up, and if Paul and John, Peter, and those others who were actually schooled by God to come out of Judaism and strictly into to Christian, then the church would have been destroyed. The devil would have destroyed it by a double standard. And the devil has done a good job to keep the church from reaching what God's ultimate goal is. We are a hospital for the sick church. We are a hospital for the beaten back and the forgotten about. We are a hospital for those who are poor and wretched and have lost their way. Most people who are sinners don't know how to stop sinning. And they don't understand, how can I get out of this thing? They've gone to church. They've gone to several churches. They find more issues in the church than they do in the world. That's why they're not beating our doors down to get here. And I'm hoping by the power of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit that I will give you something that will help you live out into this world to let your little light shine. Hallelujah. Because there's a darkened world that's starving to death. They're sitting in darkness and waiting for the light to come, and the light's not coming. It comes to church. But then when it goes out the door, it blows its candle out. It ends up being a bunch of secret service agents for God. God doesn't need secret service agents. Maybe the president does, but God doesn't. He's a big boy. He can take care of himself. He needs some light that will shine. And so this book of Hebrews continues to refer back to the patriarchs of old, in whom saw this promise of Jesus afar off and believed it. God, however he did it, revealed Jesus Christ that was coming. They go, yes, Lord. Now we understand why we have to slay this lamb because this lamb represents that is what is to come. And because that we do this according to your word, then we could expect to get what your word says. See, the church is not getting what the Word says because we're not doing what the Word says to do. And therein lies the problem. The problem's not with God. The problem's within the body of Christ. And it all starts with the word faith, which if you break it down, means believe. Now, when you read the Word of God, I will, I will give you your due. Some of the things that happen within the Word of God is hard to believe. We look at... And uh, me and my wife were just discussing this the other day. Elisha. Elisha and the story of Elijah. Now, Elijah was a powerful, anointed man of God. And he knew his time was short. And so God linked him up with another man, prophet, called Elisha. Elijah, Elisha. Two different, two different names, two different men. And so when they come into contact, Elisha, Elijah says to Elisha, what is it that you want from me? And he'd been watching him. He said, I want a double portion 
of that anointing that you have. He said, you've asked a hard thing. Now, if you go back and you look at the word hard in the Greek, you find out that he actually asked for a good thing. But yet it was hard for Elijah to say, I'm going to just give it to you. He said, I'll tell you what. If you're here when I leave, and, and, and Elijah knew that his time was short. Elijah is one of two men, Enoch and Elijah, who were taken alive, who will come back during, after the, the resurrection and uh, during the tribulation period. They will come back and they will stand before the temple and they will preach Jesus Christ 24-7 and the Antichrist can't do anything about it until a certain time was given up and then they will be killed by the Antichrist. The Antichrist thinks that he's won. Three days later, he's going to do the same thing they did to them, they did to Jesus, and he's going to rise in front of all the cameras. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Will I see that preacher? Nope, you ain't going to be here. But I've already told you about it. So by faith, we have to believe that. Why do I have to believe that? Because the Word of God said so. That's why. Well, I don't always agree with the Word of God. Then you need to get saved. Therein lies the problem. I agree to it wholeheartedly, totally, with this Word that I have here in my hand. It is the most precious thing that we hold within our hands, but more precious is this word that is in our hearts by Jesus Christ and the spirit thereof. Hallelujah. That's why David said, hide thy word in my heart. And in this great book of Hebrews, do we see name after name after name who believed in what Jesus was going to do when he came. That's why Abraham, a Chaldean, an idol maker, least expected to be a spokesman of God, end up being the father of now the Jewish nation in which is over in Israel. And he's in heaven now. We know that to be a fact because Jesus Christ went down into paradise because the devil had a legal decree to hold them captive, but God would not let them hurt them. They were not on the burning side of hell. They were on the side of paradise. Read, uh, read Luke chapter 14, I believe it is. And you'll understand the story. Abraham was counted righteousness by his faith. And this is where we're going to start off with the story in goes into Abraham, if you will. First scripture, if you will, please. Verse 16, chapter 11. But now they, talking about all the patriarchs that has gone on before, Paul makes this reference. But now they desire a better country that is in a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Now, it seems like to me that the world in all their um, immorality is not ashamed of it. Not only are they not ashamed of it, they promote it. Companies promote it. Businesses promote it. Read on the news today, one of, one of the female soccer players got benched because she would not wear a, great, a gay pride shirt. Now, there's something wrong in America, church, that when everybody else's opinion and their rights are their rights, but the right of the right is not right. I sound like Festus Hagen, don't I? <laughs> But it's the plan of God. And here's the plan. Are you going to have the faith that the patriarchs had? Are you going to cut and run? Are you going to hide in your house? Are you going to rip the bumper stickers off your car and say, you got a friend in Jesus? Are you going to quit wearing your T-shirts that has the cross of Christ on it and Pearson saved my life? Those kind of things. Come on. Come on. Give him some praise in the house. Because that's what it's going to come down to. When it comes down to me making the decision whether I'm going to serve God by the way that the Word tells me I'm going to serve, or they're going to put me in jail, you'll have to come visit me on Sunday because that's where I'm going to be. Hallelujah. That's where I'm going to be. And it'll be the worst place they ever put me because I'll start a revival in there by the power of the Holy Spirit and I'll get the guards and I'll get the warden and I'll get the prisoners and I'll get everybody that comes in the door saved in the name of Jesus and we'll have a revival. A fence can't hold Jesus out. Razor wire can't hold him back. Maximum security 
cannot keep the Holy Spirit from coming into one's life. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was trying to think of Brother Jimmy's last name. He's gone on to be with the Lord. He was with our ministry for quite a while. He was one of the biggest drug dealers on the eastern shore. Sent him to jail. He was looking pretty much at a, at a life sentence. There in jail, he seriously found Jesus on the jailhouse floor, crying out to God, coming off the drugs. Got himself straightened out. And Oh, prior to that, let me back up a little bit. He was one of, one of a handful who successfully escaped out of SCI. It took him days to find him. <laughs> and and, and, he, and listen to this. He's, he's, he's a drug-dealing kingpin. He escapes from jail. He finds Jesus. He gets a reprieve from the governor of all of his sentence and set free out of a, almost a life sentence. He would never, he would have died in jail with, with the years he had on him. They set him free. He goes to school and ends up being a registered nurse and is in, has the key to the drug cabinet. <laughs> Only God can do that, church. Only God, by faith in what his word says, can do that. And he desired a better country. What is it that we desire? We, did, we know that there's a better place for us to go other than here. I certainly hope that there is. If you listen to Joel Osteen, you're living your best life now. Boy, I hope not. This is the best it gets. I, we just might as well stay where we're at. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be their God. I'm not ashamed to be a pastor. I'm not ashamed to be called a man of God. I'm not ashamed of the word of God. I'm not ashamed of the, the life in which God has given me by his grace. A lot of Christians are afraid to say anything. If I say anything, I'm offend them. You've already offended them when you show up because you brought the Holy Spirit with you. The Holy Spirit's already convicted them of their sins. They've already called you a Bible thumper and Jesus freak, whatever else term they can come up with. That's fine. That's exactly what I am. I'm a Bible thumper, Jesus freak. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something right now. You have never been in love unless you have been in love with Jesus and he loves you back. You don't know what love's about. You have no, no, no idea. Not ashamed to be called their God, for he had prepared for them a city. Next verse, please. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he had received the promise, offered up his only begotten son. Now, this was a hands-on lesson that God gave Abraham, and we all know the story, and I, don't, I won't go completely through it. Abraham and Sarah tried to help God, which produced Ishmael, and has produced the Muslim nation and the Arabic nation of what we uh, deal with today. And I don't know what problems that we would serve, but we would not have served them as we are right now had Abraham and Sarah not had tried to help God. Listen closely. God's a big God. He can handle it. Bring all your prayers and supplications known unto him and let him take care of it. Don't try to fix it. Because the more man tries to fix it, the more man will mess it up. So then he has this promised child some 13, 15 years later than Ishmael. And he knows it's the promised child because now of the age, they're well, well above the hundred now because it was years after, after uh, Ishmael was born. And so now they have this promised child and he is going to be the lineage of Jesus. That seed. That seed that God promised in Genesis 3 and 15. I'm going to put a seed in thy woman. And he shall bust your head and you'll bruise his heel. The heel bruising was depicting the cross and the suffering that he would go through. But the bruised head was now the victory over sin, death, hell, and the grave is what comes through Jesus Christ. Church, I know we're sinners and we're saved by grace, but God doesn't see you as a sinner. He sees you as a saint. He sees you as the perfection of his son's blood. Hallelujah. Oh, no, we can't never get away from the fact of who we are. 
Because who we are keeps us on our knees. Who we are keeps us to recognize how great God is. And I will tell you something. As much as I think, as much as I read, as much as I want to understand, how great I think God is would be no more than a thimble full of water in an ocean of how great he really is. We just don't know. But we know that it is. And that doesn't change anything because we can't comprehend or understand, but we still believe. So you have great faith. You have as great faith as the people that I'm getting ready to talk about because you're a person and who has accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're no longer going to hell. You're on your way to heaven. You're spirit-filled. God is blessing your life, and yet you were not there. You did not see it happen. You had never seen Jesus hanging on the cross nor taking down and wrapped up and put in a grave. You have never seen Jesus resurrected as they saw him resurrected. Remember the day that he spent 40, he spent 40 days with his disciples and other people showing the resurrection and the power thereof. And then he showed that God has no bearing when it comes to physics because all of a sudden on the Mount of Olives, he started to rise right in front of their eyes. And I don't blame them. They stood there with jaws dropped in absolutely amazement. And the angels, they didn't think much of it. They go, why, why do you stand here in such amazement? Because the same way that he's left is the same way he's coming back. He's coming back, church. He's coming back. Oh, hallelujah. Next verse, please. To whom it was said that Isaac shall be thy seed called. Now, when God put the Holy Spirit down inside of you, who is it you think that lives there? Casper the ghost? It's not just something you have. It is the very essence and the presence of God that you go everywhere. He goes everywhere that you go. Newsflash, he hears everything that you say. Mm. Can we thank God for some grace today? Amen. Can we thank God? I know you're all saints. You don't never say anything wrong and... You know, you, you never in your mind want to flip that guy off that just cut you off at the stoplight. You didn't do it, thank God, hallelujah. But you thought it. And let me tell you something about thought life. Jesus said to his Pharisees, after this episode with the woman who was caught in adultery, he said, don't you think you ain't committed adultery? You ain't been with a woman, but you thought it in your mind. And they went, oh, <laughs> The mind is an enemy against God. It does not filter out trash. It holds it. It has no delete button. You cannot take what's recorded in your mind, highlight it, and hit delete, and it goes away and never comes back. It's an enemy against God. It's always going to be there. The mind will have you to think that the world has overtaken the church. I will guarantee you that has not happened nor is it going to happen. God is going to continue to pour out his, his, his Spirit on all people who will believe Him in a mighty form. So when Elisha and Elijah got together, and Elisha was taken up in a whirlwind, this fabric mantle fell down. Now there was nothing anointed about the mantle. It was the faith in which Elisha had. And Elisha picked up that mantle in believing that he had received what Elisha, Elijah had given him. Now, in this story, it's very interesting. Most people read over it and never saw it. For Elijah to lead Elisha to the place of faith in which he knew that he was going to, Elijah took his coat off and he smote the river. And the river opened as like the Red Sea and they walked across it on dry land. That was the last miracle that Elijah did. And it was the first miracle that Elisha did. Because when he came back to that river, he said, I saw what my brother did. And God will do it for him. He'll do it for me. Let me smoke this water. And this water opened up. Oh, hallelujah. Let me tell you something right now. If anybody has ever received a miracle from God, you are a prime candidate for a miracle of God too. Never think. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Don't think for one minute that the blessings of God is not on you. Just because you think somebody's living a higher status quo 
by the car that they maybe drove here today or the home that they might live in. Yeah, they're all a blessings, but probably most of them is owned by the bank. And you pay them once a month just to rent it. So you don't own your car until you get that title in your hand got your name on it. The bank owns your car. You stop paying on it. You'll find out who owns it. You go out in your yard and it won't be there. <laughs> you call 911 and you're like, somebody stole my car. Yeah, it was a record service down the street. They got it in impound. You're about three months behind. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you something else. If you do own anything, then the glory goes to God because he gave it to you. Amen. He gave it to you. Next verse, please. Counting that God was able to rise him up even from the dead from whence he also received him in a figure. Now, let me read this, if you will, again, and I want to read it with the expositor study, study note. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, and the Lord had told Abraham, Offer up Isaac as a sacrifice, and the patriarch proceeded to obey, which God stopped at the last minute. But in his mind, he had already offered up Isaac. In his mind, he had already offered him up. There was no stopping him. If that's what God demanded from him, then that's what he would do. In his mind, and he already offered up Isaac, reasoning that God would raise him from the dead because it was through, through Isaac that the Redeemer would become the Savior of the world. See, we have to look at things differently. We look at things in the here and now, in the natural, but God looks at everything and gives us everything in the future. And that's where our faith lies. That's why that Christians are running around mopey and dopey and everything else because they can't see past today. This is the day that the Lord has made. He said rejoice in it. Amen. He didn't say you had to like it. He didn't say you had to like what's going on. But he said this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice in it. Hallelujah. That's what God's looking for. He's looking for our faith in him that no matter what the world is doing, and it's going to hell in a handbasket as fast as the unlocked wheels of time is turning. But I can tell you right now, as fast as they're going to hell in the handbasket, we're going to heaven in God's hand. Hallelujah. That's where we're going. I think the preacher just cussed. No. You need to understand something. Hell is not a cuss word. It's a destination. And the devil, now... You can pervert it. There's not much you can't pervert. But that's not perverted. Hell is not perverted. It is a destination for the damned and the unsaved. And it's very little talked about because people don't like sermons about hell. We like sermons about Cadillacs and split-level homes and boats and planes and trips and fine suits and all those other things. We like those, them prosperity preachers. So what? You got more money than Bill Gates. And you die. And how much did you take with you? Not a thing. Not a thing. Wonder how many. Let me tell you what. We could all make a good living. Often what Bill Gates has to pay. For people to watch his money. I don't need that help. I can pull what I got in my hand. And look at it anytime I want to. And almost to the penny, tell you what's there. I don't need people to watch out for me. I got God watching out for me. Hallelujah. Come on. <laughs> now, I do not know what the status of Bill Gates' heart is. And I pray that the man gets saved. And he moves to Delaware. And comes to Bethel Worship Center. <laughs> and see, you thought I just wanted his money. Well, I cannot tell a lie. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm more concerned over a person's soul than I am about their money. Because God takes care of his house when the house takes care of God. Hallelujah. Next verse, please. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob. Esau concerning the things to come. Now, I want to read it out of Expositor's uh, uh, Bible so you'll better understand. Hang on. Verse 20. 
By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning the things to come. Isaac blessed the two uh, young because of the faith he looked forward beyond death. Meaning this, he told them about the coming of the Savior that would be part of their lineage. Let me go a little farther. Verse 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both of the sons of Joseph, pertains to Manasseh and Ephraim. And both were born to Joseph in Egypt and worshipped. And for many reasons, but primarily because the Redeemer, who was going to come through the prosperity, meaning the lineage of these people. And leaning upon, now this is important. I never saw this before. In all the years that I've studied the book of Hebrews, this just kind of leaped out to me and never paid any mind to it, and nobody would unless you understand why. Let me read the, I'll read the, I'll read it down to there. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed the sons of, uh, of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. Why? What did that have to do with anything? Why would Paul put that there? If I asked you a trivia question, why did Jacob lean on the staff after he blessed these boys? You go, I don't know. I didn't know either. After all the years, I have studied the Word of God. See, you, you can't never learn everything. But you can learn something. And for the last year that Jacob had lived, he had carved the miracles and the happenings of what God had did in his life and his family. And he would hold that word in his hand. And when it said it leaned on that staff, it means he leaned on the word of God. And that is one thing you and I must do every day of our lives is lean on the word of Almighty God and trust nothing that you see, trust nothing that you taste, trust nothing that you feel, but trust the everlasting word of God that you know that's down in your hearts. Can somebody help me preach up in here? Lean upon the staff of God. We lean upon everything else but that. I'm not anti-doctor by no means. I go to doctors, not, not often. Uh, the first time I went to a doctor, it had probably been at least 20 or 25 years. Since I, and I give God the glory for that, that I graced a doctor's office. And the nurse came in, and she said, uh, Mr. LeCase, are you allergic to anything? I said, yes. She said, what are they? I said, doctors and nurses. <laughs> and she looked at me right funny. And... Uh, she said, why did you say that? I said, well, this is the first time I've been here in 25 years, and I'm ready to leave now. <laughs> so I must be allergic to doctors and nurses. And she just laughed and went on. But I do believe in, in, in medicine and thank God for it. Uh, but sometimes it comes to a place where you've got to lean on your staff. You've got to go deep into the Word of God and say, God, I believe you more than I believe my doctor. Now, I'm not telling you to run home and clean out your medicine cabinet. Don't do no such a thing as that. But it's just some places we get in life. The medicine don't work no more. And we got to lean on the hand of God. And I'm telling you something. Our medical society is crumbling from inside out. And the devil almost destroyed it back during the pandemic when all of a sudden, after a year, people being heroes and working on the front line are now a problem because they won't get a shot. Isn't it sad? Our heroes have worked out there in our emergency people going to houses and picking up people who know, who know before they get there has COVID, but yet during their duty, put them in an ambulance and took them to an emergency room. And our emergency room physicians are fighting on the front lines. Then all of a sudden, you ain't got a job because you won't do what we say. Well, let me say this. Thank God for the ones that had guts enough to say, then you do it yourself. We leave it. <laughs> I'm not anti-shot. No, sir. If you want one, get one. I don't. You're part of the problem. Well, good. I wanted to be something all my life. <laughs> so I'm part of the problem. Is Fauci part of the problem? He had a shot. Joe Biden part of the problem? He had a shot. There are a lot of them, yeah, and he got it again. Yeah. Never mind. Let's not go there. Don't get me wound up into that. Let me tell you something. 
I know you're going to find this shocking. But Joe Biden has been a blessing to the church. Because he's made the church look at God more than him. I think we idolize Donald Trump too much sometimes. And he did some good works, church. You can hate him if you want to. I don't care. I don't like the way he talks. You don't live with him. What do you care? You've got a remote. Turn him off your TV. You like $2 gasoline. You like more jobs than it was people. You liked your income going up more than it's ever gone up in history. You liked all that. I don't like his orange tan. Well, he does. So he wants to look like a sun-kissed orange. Who cares? Let me go on here and look at my bank account and say, Oh, yeah, man, I like him. <laughs> the silly things, the silly things we do. So God says, Okay, I've sent you prosperity, and you wouldn't praise me. So now let me send you disparity and see how you handle that. Church, we're, we're, we're all struggling one way or the other. We're, we're struggling to, you know, to, to buy food now. We're struggling to buy gasoline. And, it, and it's made a big dent in our pockets. It sure has. We're, you know, we're all under the gun. But let me tell you something, child of God. You will not do without. God will supply your need. He said according to his, his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Not Wall Street. Who cares about Wall Street? Well, the stock is going up. Okay, good. I don't have any. Well, the stock is going down. Even better, I don't have any. And you may do. That's, that's fine and well. man said the other day to a friend of mine, said, Man, I lost $20,000 in the stock last week. He said, No, you didn't. He said, What you mean? He said, It's all on paper. He said, You ain't lost nothing. The following week, it'll be back again. It's all just numbers. It ain't money until you can take it to the bank or put it under a mattress. I suggest it. <laughs> Leaning on the everlasting word of God will make all the difference in your life starting today. Today. Let me go to the next verse, please. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of him departing of the children of Israel, gave his commandments concerning his bones. He said, don't leave me in bondage even when I'm dead. Take me to that promised land. And it was an outwardly sign of an inward work that he knew that there was a resurrection coming and he was going. Hallelujah. We get back to a key point of Elijah and Elisha. So Elisha dies and they bury him in a cave. Open tomb. And so there was a battle going on. One of the soldiers had gotten killed long, long after Elijah. Elijah had gone. Elisha. Don't get him confused. And so in the midst of burying him and taking him to this cave, they saw the raiders coming. Now here's when you know you got an anointing. They grabbed the dead man and they throwed him in the cave and he landed on the bones of Elisha. He came running out. <laughs> you know you got anointing when you can raise the dead and you ain't even alive. Oh, hallelujah. That's a double portion of God right there. And let me tell you something. God is still pouring out double portions of his spirit for all flesh who want to receive it through the blood of the crucified Jesus Christ. Can you help me preach it here? But why do we want it? Do we want it so the rest of our friends will be envious of us? Or do the work of the Lord? That's the problem right there. Most people have never been baptized in the, in the Holy Spirit for the simple fact of the matter is God's not going to give it to them because they don't even understand why they would want it. Why would you want it? Because it brings the essence and the power of God into your life for God to use you in a mighty fashion that you've never been able to be used before. It has nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do with your blessings of God. I'm like the army. I'm going to get all I can get. I want to be all I can be. I, I want to be an ambassador for God. Not for my recognition, but for His. And there's been many great men and women of God throughout our lifetime that we can go back on and look at. Catherine Kuhlman is, is one of them. And, 
you know, some of you, you, you may not, not even like Oral Roberts, you know. I, there was a lot of things I disagreed with him, but he, he did some marvelous work and some marvelous healing happened uh, back in those years, and people were hungry. They didn't care about being in air condition. When they set up a tent for a revival, they'd bust the doors down to get there. Hallelujah. <laughs> Next Sunday night, we're going to have revival. I'm telling you, God is going to pour out like he has never poured out on Carrie's camp before, and not because I'm there, because I'm believing for the almighty move of God there. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I need you to believe with me that God gets the glory in any and everything we do. God is slowly and surely healing my voice. Uh, I was better today than I've been in months, and I thank God for that because I'm leaning on the staff of God. Hallelujah. He knows what I need when I need it. Hallelujah. And God's going to give it to us. And we're going to have a time. But you know what? There'll be go those who will walk out at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and go, It's hot. Well, let me tell you what Papa Duke used to tell me. I worked for him for years. Blessed man of God. Pop said, How you doing, boy? I said, Doing good, Pop. It's hot today. He said, Ah, no old hot place in this. I ain't got no ticket for that one. <laughs> I said, right, Pop, I got you. And he would tell that to anybody, saved or the sinning. There's a hotter place than this. But we ain't got no ticket for that one, church. Hallelujah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some scientist came up with a formula, and he said it's 14 degrees hotter in heaven than it is in hell. Now, I don't know how you come up with those numbers. But even if it is, it's still going to be a paradise for the saint of God. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Next verse, please. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child, called of God. And they were not afraid of the king's commandments. Next, next verse. Oh, that's right. Stay right there. They were not afraid of the king's commandments. They were not afraid to be different and say, no, we're going to stand on the Word of God. We're not going to bow down to you. We're not going to bow down to your silly, immoral laws that you tried to impose them on the body of Christ, whether it's through marriage or through birth control or whatever it is. The Word of God either has to stand tall in your heart or it doesn't stand at all. You cannot bow down to the kings and queens of this universe, but we must bow before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in that universe. We have to do it. We have to do it. And there will be a dividing before the last revival's over with, I do believe, in the church. And that'll be whether you're going to stand for God or you're going to cut and run. And without the power, and let me tell you something. Humanity has tried this before. Kings of states and presidential ambassadors and whatever they are has tried to impose themselves to shut the church down. And they almost did it during the pandemic. They shut the church down. And as I have said, I've done it out of respect for the people because I didn't know what this thing was. I didn't want to be rebellious and cause a whole lot of people to get sick and die and everything else because then their blood would be on my hands. But when this came, one of our local congressmen that I'm very good friends with and love him, I said, this is wrong. This is wrong, congressman. You cannot shut the house of God down. We have a constitutional right. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The governor's lawyer said we could do it. I don't care what the king's horses said. I don't want, care what the king's men said. If you want Humpty Dumpty to be fixed, take it to the one who made him to start with. We took him to the wrong place. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horsemen and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It's because they took it to the wrong place. Oh, yeah, the lawyer said that we could do it. Your lawyers are a fool. Thank God for two churches up in, up in Newcastle County sued Delaware 
and now they can never shut the church down again. We'll make the decision. And if it's a health regard decision, then I and the leadership will get together and we will come up with the best plan we can to keep you safe. And if we have to shut it down, it's because that God told us to shut the building down to keep you safe. We're not shutting down no more. The silliest mess we ever got. By faith, Moses, when he was come years, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh. Listen to this. This is good. Man, I'm almost ready to amen myself. <laughs> I'm just messing with you all. <laughs> By faith, when Moses was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And, and I'm going down to 25. In effect, rebuked the position of Pharaoh and of Egypt. And it had been trained because he had been adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Meaning this. Now think about this. Think what Moses gave up in the natural to gain the supernatural. And are we willing? Are we willing to give up the things of the world? I'm not talking about you have to not eat ice cream or don't watch television or go to a movie. You know, there, there, was, there was times that, that if you was a church-going person, you didn't have a television in your house. Of course, that probably wouldn't hurt us any. To be honest with you. And they didn't dare go to a movie. Oh, oh, you're going to hell. You go to a movie. Boy, how times have changed. We don't have to go to a movie no more. We got 78, 90-inch color TVs in our house. We got more channels than you could set up and watch in a month. <laughs> we don't even have to go to the movies anymore. Choosing rather to suffer affliction. Now, here's a man. Second of command of the greatest army in the world. He had the finest clothes, the finest food, the finest women. Authority that when he walked into a room, people bowed down to him. But there was something about Moses that Moses didn't even know, but yet he kind of, he figured it out, obviously. Something's missing. This is not who I am. I don't really know how I got here. But I know it just, it's not right. It just doesn't feel right. Watch. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. See, sin has a season. Whether you start out as a toddler telling lies, end up as a teenager in a detention center somewhere, for stealing shoplifting or then end up in jail because you robbed a liquor store. Sooner or later, that sin will run its course and kill you and you'll die and go to hell. And sin always has a pleasure for a season, but when the season is ended, the devil wants payment. God didn't ask you for payment. He paid for it. You don't owe God nothing. You will always owe the devil something. <laughs> Listen to the note. Choosing to suffer, choosing rather to suffer the afflictions uh, with the people of God proclaims the choice that Moses made to trade the temporal for the eternal. The temporal pleasures of life now, that is not to say that God does not want you, Christian, to live a comfortable life. I admire the Amish people. I really do. I admire their plain lifestyle. I would never be able to do it because I had been in the pleasures of life too long that I would rather look out my windshield than stare a mule in the, in the backside. <laughs> it's all good. You say, well, they ain't paying $5 a gallon for gas, but no, they're paying $10 a bale for hay to feed that mule with. So it don't get any different for them either. I appreciate their lifestyle of family. Uh, nobody goes to a nursing home. You ever seen an Amish in a nursing home? No, nope. and you won't. I don't care if you go to Lancaster or wherever you go. You won't see them because they will build a house next door or attached to their house, and they will bring those elderly in there and the family will take care of them. Now, mind you, they'll have about a dozen youngins, so that ain't a problem. 
you and I, that creates another issue altogether. I admire their lifestyle. I admire their plain living of clothes and how they uh, conduct their life. But church, the Amish are no more saved than you are. Who drives a car, who lives in a house with air condition, and does the things in which you do, and wear modest clothes of whatever the case may be. See, God doesn't have a dress code other than the fact he just asked us to dress appropriately. Now, that's gotten out a little out of hand, too, <laughs> in a lot of ways, but nevertheless. Some things are just not going to change. Some things are just not going to get better other than the church. See, the church, Sussex County, we're just going to get gooder and gooder all the time. <laughs> we're going to get gooder and gooder all the time. Why? Because we believe. We believe in these past passages. It's in what's this great book of Hebrews, and, 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 it, and it's called the Hall of Faith, and that's what it is. And all of these people went through times that you, that you and I could not endure anymore. We couldn't endure. We're, 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 we're just not built like that any longer. You know, I was blessed to have Irene King, who gave me that 200-year-old cabin, and... It took me a while, but we got it restored, and it, and, it, and it really does look nice, and I kept it period correct. The only thing I've done to it is put a little electric in there to turn the light on so you can see. But when I look at those logs, and I think about who put this thing together? Who stood out there painstakingly and hewn out these curves and these logs and figured out how to stack these logs on four walls and keep them somewhat even when they got to the top. It didn't look like this when they put a roof on it. Who was this person? It has four by six beams made out of pine that are square. They're four inches one way, six inches the other way. Somebody took a mad axe and they, and they painstakingly took a round log day after day, hour after hour, hewing away at those logs. And I thought sometimes I said, you know what? Just them beams right there remind me what the Holy Spirit does in our life. Hewns away after us, day after day, making us useful, making us to be able to be put in a place that God wants us to be. Because every one of those beams are painstakingly put in the right place to hold that building up. And in that entire structure of those logs, they're held up by faith. They're not nailed. They're just stacked. Is all they are. There's no nails in it. And all the weight to that, the distribution of the weight of that, of that log cabin is not in the centers of the logs. It's on the corners. So it has to have a firm foundation. And if you don't have the foundation block of Jesus Christ in your life, then you're going to crumble. It's not going to stand in the last days in which you live in. Come on, come on, come on. Hallelujah. All right, we're cranking down to the end here. Verse 26, please. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Moses said, Esteeming the reproach of Christ is greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect for the recompense of the reward. He said, All this that the world can offer me can never be compared to what God has laid up for me. Paul said, The sufferings of this world cannot be compared to the glory in which I will see when I get to the other side. So never think for one minute God has cast you out or he's somewhat mad at you. He wants to punish you. Listen, church, God is a long way from punishing you. But he may correct you and often does, including me. And we should desire the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Convict me, Lord, of my wrongdoing and then give me the power and ability to straighten that up. When Paul said that we should not never ever be a slaves to sin, that he was right. We're not. We're not a servant to sin. You were. I was. We serve sin every day, habitually. Never give it no thought. You know why you didn't give it any thought? Because you were dead. 
You were dead, dying, and on your way to hell. No thought of it at all. But then one fine day, somebody preached, somebody talked, somebody talked, somebody gave a testimony, somebody told you about Jesus, or you found a track, or whatever the case may be. Or maybe from years ago, that mama used to take you to, 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 to the little old church that had wooden benches, had wooden benches, had wooden benches, no air conditioning. Preacher preached for an hour and a half. Bottoms were so sore when they got up, they flooded to the altar to get healed. <laughs> Couldn't even feel our backsides no more. They were numb. Now we got to have cushion chairs, good air condition. Give me 15 minutes of a sermon. Let me go home. Well, I would like to, but that's not what God's called me to do. Because I get you. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I get you one hour a week, most of them. And I thank God for that. I don't mean any ridicule by it at all. But God gets you for one hour. He wants to give you all he can give you. Why? Because you're going to need it this week. You don't know what Monday's going to bring. I'm going to work Monday. Well, uh, will you? What if you have an accident on the way and get killed? You ain't going to work. question is, where are you going? That would be a greater question. Sure, I'm planning on getting up and doing something Monday, uh, whether I work for somebody else or work for my wife. I'd rather work for somebody else. They pay better. <laughs> But I get enjoyment out of working for either one of them. Doesn't make any difference. Hallelujah. Yeah, we got plans. But what if those plans doesn't come, church? You ever thought about that? Look, I, I, I read on the local news every day. Every day. Millsboro, Georgetown, Salisbury, all around us. People having traffic accidents. Two get killed, three get killed. We're, we're just susceptible to death as anybody else is. But my death is my gain. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, come on. That does not mean that I'm not cautious. That does not mean that, 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 that I don't not look both ways. If I come, I look both ways when my light is green. I look. But they don't look. I mean, they just, they just don't look. So we don't know. We've got to be as cautious as we can. D.L. Moody. He was one of the great founders in, uh, in New York and a founder of the gospel. Once was asked, D.L., if you knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would you do today? He said, I'd plant a tree. Now, that's an odd answer, isn't it? Plant a tree? Why would you plant a tree if you knew Jesus was coming back? And he said, because if he don't, then I plan for tomorrow, but I'm hoping for today that it just might be that day when he comes back. Amen. Go ahead. So what was D.L. really saying? Live, church. Live. Live for Jesus. It's the most exciting time that you have. Church, I'm excited. I have been more excited in the last month than I've ever been excited in my life for two reasons. One, I'm on Medicare. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know it's the best insurance out there because you've all been living since the dinosaurs. <laughs> don't throw nothing but money no tomatoes please no eggs just money <laughs> you have to laugh at it you have to laugh at it when you now you used to jump into bed and you crawl in it remember when you used to jump out of it now you fall out of it <laughs> and I do I laugh at myself oftentimes. Because I know that you, you know, some of y'all got a few years on me. I understand that. But life changes. It changes quickly. And uh, once you reach 50, you ain't getting 50 more. So you better plan and take care of the ones you got left. Because they're coming quick. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. But I turn 65 on the 26th. That means I'm 15 years from 80. Makes a difference. But whatever years I got left, church, I want to live them the best I can for Jesus. I want to do and be all I can be in the name of the Lord. I want people to look back on my life and say, that was a man of God who loved God, and I do love God, and God loves you, and he's concerned about you, and he knows what's going on in your life, and he knows how he can fix it if you'll just let him fix it. Can you help me preach? <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen, listen, next verse, please. 
Oh, hallelujah. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. See, I'm not worried about what the government thinks that they can do to me. They can lock me up. They can hang me by the neck. But God is still going to be with me every step of the way. Hallelujah. I fear no man, church. And I don't mean that in a boastful position. But I do fear the one that Jesus said could cast your soul into, his soul into hell. Don't fear no man. Whether it be by reverence or the power in which they have. Now, I'm a respecter of authority. When a policeman stops me, I am yes, sir, or yes, ma'am, or no, ma'am, or whatever the case may be. Give them whatever they want, and if I don't like the ticket, I'll take it to court. We'll fight it out there. But I'm a person of authority, or, or, or should I say, backup authority. And our police force is now under attack. They're under attack not only bodily, but even mentally, because the people in whom they pull over verbally, verbally abuse them. I don't know why you stopped me. Well, a hundred and a thirty-five, do you think that might not catch my attention? <laughs> and it's always an excuse why you stop me. It's this or that or whatever. Oh, come on. Give me a break. Yeah. Help me, Lord. Next verse, please. Through faith, he kept the Passover. I'll get to that in a minute. And the sprinkling of blood. Least he who destroyed the first bo uh, firstborn should touch them. Now, I'm going to stop pretty much right here unless God tells me to do different. Uh, ben, you can come on back. And I'll talk about the other verses that are left. There's many more left. When we see this Passover, and this is why that Moses was gaining faith by everything God did. Now mind you, mind you now, very quickly, Moses being born of a time when Pharaoh said, kill every male child two years old and younger. Kill him. And they did. But Moses' mother had faith enough to build a basket with mud. It's called pitch. It's like tire. Put him in that basket. Send him down the Nile, crocodile, snake-infested water, and land at the feet of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, church, you either got to say that's a fairy tale. Or I got faith, that's what God did. I have faith, that's what God did. Hallelujah. To pick that child up, to raise him up to be a voice of authority. Now, let me tell you something. Very quickly. God did almost the same thing to me. When Moses was raised in authority, he had to learn authority in order to have authority over 2.5 million people to lead them in the direction that God was telling them. He had to understand authority. And God raised him up under the devil's expense. Did the same thing to me. I said in bar room after bar room after bar room after bar room. I learned how to drink for free. You know all I had to do was take one guitar, set it at the bar, and say, He stopped loving me today. Or her. <laughs> oh, they bite you beer all night long. In this one Sunday morning, in a city of Flint, Michigan, standing in a church of God, and there was hundreds of people, hundreds, the biggest church I've ever sang in my life. And I'm sitting there, and I'm singing the bass line, and God is speaking, and he says, See, the devil thought he had you. I only let him raise you up at his expense. Now you mind. I said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Never missed a note or a word the whole time God's speaking. See, you don't know why God has brought you maybe yet. But I'm telling you, you're for a reason. And you're for a purpose just as such as a time of this. For just as a time of this. 
You were not born in the year that you were born in just because that mom and daddy decided to have a child. No, sir. They made it decided, but God put it down in their heart to have you here today on this day, on this date, to hear the Word of God like you maybe not heard it before, but you're going to hear it again because God's going to continue to rain down His anointing on His people. What's it going to take? What's it going to take to believe this everlasting Word of God? What's it going to take to believe that we're the miracle workers in which God has called us to be? What's it going to take to believe that we're ambassadors to a hurt and dying world? That we're to take the light of God to them? If they're ever going to come, we got to go to them. Well, ain't that the preacher's job? No. It's sheep job. Sheep begat sheep. Preacher, she shepherd. Oh, hallelujah. And it ain't that I don't do my share now. I look for every opportunity in the world. Boy, you just hit anything close to something and I'll be on it like a duck on a June bug. <laughs> Getting away from me like that. And it's sometimes it's not blowing them out of the water, which that never helps, but it's just little things in which that you can say. Such as, I'll close here. well-known prominent businessman had been shafted out of a lot of money. Give the man a second chance and he got him again. And he says to me, this was a church going man telling me that I needed Jesus. And I said, yeah. I don't know whether you do or you don't, but I will tell you that you do. And I don't know you nothings I know of. And I said, let me tell you something. There's two types of people that you well know that I've talked about before that are in the house of God. They're church people. They're Christians. Don't get them confused. They share the same building, but they don't have the same heart. Hallelujah. <laughs> Time for the church to step up and be the men and women of God that the Word's called us to be with integrity. Moses had integrity. Jesus. You can't get more integrity than Jesus. And if you and I are Christ-like, then we're supposed to be Christ-like. not saying you're not going to make a mistake. But boy, let me tell you something that shows a lot of respect towards people. That you as a Christian, and you say something, or you do something, or you act some way in front of the world's people that you shouldn't do, and they see you, you should apologize. So you know what? Please accept my apology for the way that I acted towards you. That's not who I am. And I ask for your forgiveness. And that's all you can do at that point. But I will tell you one thing. That will go a long way. Instead of trying to hold your ground on something you thought you were right in, most of the time we're wrong in them anyway. I know. I understand. I get emotional when I go out in this world. It drives me crazy. Why can't I go to McDonald's and get an order right? I gave you the number. I won't even go to a drive-in that I don't order by the number. Don't tell him you don't want no pickles. You ain't getting nothing. <laughs> that just messed them up. That drives me crazy. That people no longer want to do their job or care about doing their job. It amazes me. And here's where Christians had the edge. When we walk on a job, we should be on the job to do the job until the job's done and get the money. And don't go around and people go, ah, this man don't pay nothing. Well, go get another job then. Cry, baby. That's terrible. And if we're going to be the church of God that God said to be, then we've got to be the church on the outside of these walls and as well as on the inside. <laughs> Let's stand in the house of God today. Thank you so much for being patient with me. But I will tell you right now, God wants your heart. From the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. God wants you. He loves you. He cares about you. Whatever your situation is, now watch this, you might be the key to somebody else's situation. Prayer changes things. Your prayer is important this morning. Your prayer of faith, of stepping out of where you're at and down to a good old-fashioned altar. Hallelujah. I will never, 
ever pastor a church that doesn't have an altar. That's ludicrous. That's like a swimming pool with no water. What good is it? It's just a hole in the ground. Come this morning. Come. Let God touch your life. Let him enrich you and bless you like you've never been before. Brother John, please sing.